Welcome to our series, Driving Public Sector Innovation, where we look at how public sector agencies are unleashing AI-powered database solutions to drive innovation and improve agency operations, as well as deliver more effective services securely. I'm Wyatt Cash with Scoop News Group, and here to talk about how AI applications, the cloud, and scalable databases are helping agencies uh, better empower their employees is Dr. Kimberly McManus, Deputy Chief Technology Officer of Artificial Intelligence at the Department of Veterans Affairs, and Andrew Davidson, Senior Vice President of Products at MongoDB. Uh, Kimberly and Andrew, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, Kimberly, I'd like to start with you. Uh, how are public sector agencies and uh, the Veterans Affairs uh, Department in particular integrating AI to, uh, to streamline workflows and and what data management improvements uh, have you observed in doing that? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, so we're in the early stages of using AI to streamline workflows, but we have a few pilot projects in progress. So one big category of those is on how we streamline workflows for healthcare providers. So right now in the Veterans Health Administration, we're running these AI tech sprints, uh, which are in two different categories. So one is ambient dictation for clinical encounter notes. So these are, this is a challenge for healthcare providers to write up notes from the visits with uh, their patients, et cetera. This particular technology automates that. So it will record a doctor patient conversation transcribe and summarize that note for a doctor to review and then put into the EHR. Uh, and so this is one example of how we're thinking about streamlining workflows. And right now we're in the testing phase of that and planning on moving to the pilot phase soon. Another example is with community care document processing. So at the v Department of Veterans Affairs, we get a lot of documents from outside places. And one example of those are documents from care in the community. These are PDFs that contain a ton of information uh, and we need a way to extract that in, uh, to streamline that workflow. And so the project here is around using optical character recognition and extraction from extraction of the PDFs to get those medical concepts and summaries of that information into our medical record in a streamlined fashion. So that's also in an early phase right now, but we're seeing positive results and are optimistic um, moving into the pilot phase. And then the third thing I'll mention is we are working on a generative AI chat interface pilot where we have found that there are many use cases across the entire department, everything from summarizing feedback from surveys to assisting HR employees with understanding their own policy documents. And so we have a chat interface pilot that we're running now that will allow faster search and summarization of a wide variety of information at VA. Sounds like a lot of uh, possibilities there in improving uh, performance and uh, efficiency across the department. Uh, thank you for sharing those. Uh, uh, Andrew, I'm curious, uh, from your additional perspective, how else are you seeing public sector agencies more broadly uh, integrate AI into to, to streamline their workflows and uh, in particular with data management improvements uh, as an outcome? I mean, there are use cases across the board, both in the public sector and the private sector. I thought those were some great examples and actually really cover the, the spectrum of some of the most common we're seeing. Certainly knowledge agents and customer service agents that are all about empowering internal employees to better service citizens and or customers, depending on the context, is one of the most common use cases we're seeing. You know, I think taking a step back, people are feeling generally a bit overwhelmed right now. Most Enterprises certainly are in that early stage of adoption here, feeling a bit overwhelmed because every week or every month there's a new headline, you know, a new component of the stack being disrupted, a new large language model, a new inference service, a new uh, framework. And so it's kind of this question of where do I place my bets to feel like I'm not going to be left behind quickly? And I think the good news is the teams that get it right now are realizing this is fundamentally about building software. So it's about empowering full, full stack software teams but taking advantage of new tools. And at its core, it's about ensuring that you're thinking about pulling data into your operational data layer and making that data available to use with retrieval augmented generation. And the skill set for doing that, whether it involves OCR from documents or 
pulling data in from end users and kind of learning these workflows. Uh, once you kind of look at it, it, it becomes pretty demystified and accessible to people. And then uh, Kimberly, back to you. You know, you, you mentioned AI, but talk to us a little bit about more, uh, a little bit more about data management platforms and how, how are those platforms uh, combined with AI helping to, um, you know, foster more innovative solutions uh, at the Department of Veterans Affairs? Yeah, so I think a lot of it is around choosing the right data management platform and the right database for whatever kind of use case you're trying to accomplish. So we deal with a lot of different types of data at VA and we do a lot of different types of things to them. So uh, in some scenarios, we have transactional databases that work for our uh, highly transactional processes. Uh, we have a big enterprise data warehouse where and a data platform where we do a lot of our AI and data analytics work. And so that contains the majority of the data at VA and centralizing that in a location that individuals can go to to do those data analytics without having to go to many different other places. And then in combination with that, ensuring that we have a strong data catalog is another area that we're working on. So we can identify the different types of data that we have available uh, across VA as well. And then of course, in the newer space of AI, et cetera, there's new types of databases such as vector databases that we're exploring as well for some of the, the pilots that I mentioned above. Appreciate that. Uh, Andrew, can you comment a little further about the kind of how data management platforms in fact, are, are really evolving in this age of AI and you know, how they're better able to foster uh, innovative solutions at federal agencies. Totally, you know, I, I, the, not only are we seeing the, the data solutions themselves evolving, but it's also the team structures. You know, traditionally you might've had the central data team that operated off the lake or warehouse and separately you'd have the full stack software teams operating off the transactional data store. And because these applications are fundamentally operational in nature, we're, we're seeing the need to bring that data talent into the full stack software team. And what we're able to do now is take advantage of modern data models like the document model, which is a really good fit, especially for retrieval augmented generation. Going back to that notion that we're gonna have data from lots of different sources, lots of different rich shape to it. We're gonna to wanna to be able to flexibly express it and put it to use in our software. And if you look at really what the core of retrieval augmented generation is, it's this idea, or RAG is the, is the acronym, it's this idea that essentially you take a prompt in from an end user, you use that prompt to find nearest result data from the database using a vector search or vector, data, vector database capability. You take the response from the database that was relevant, the unencoded pre-vectorized data, you feed that to a large language model with a prompt engineering pipeline, then you send that back to the end user. That loop, a very simplified vision of that loop, really the core challenge there is getting the data modeling correct in your document database, having the right data in your vector search index, and having those integrated into the same capability is certainly what we focus on at, at MongoDB. Uh, and it has a number of benefits that make it easy to get started with these applications. Well, next I'd like to ask uh, Kimberly, you know, I, I would say that um, uh, uh, all agencies, but particularly uh, VA is probably uh, particularly concerned about preserving the privacy of the data that you're collecting, uh, you know, across the VA. Can you talk a little bit about how uh, these kind of data management platforms and AI tools are helping to actually uh, enable privacy preserving data analysis so that you can collect the data, but still uh, gain the insights that you need? Yeah, VA, we're exploring a variety of pathways. Of course, we have very strong privacy preserving access controls uh, as our kind of baseline foundation. Uh, and then new, newer types of technology that we're exploring are things like differential privacy. So there are methods and tools where we can allow pretty fine scale access based on the project that a person is working on, what columns of a database, et cetera, that they are able to access. So that is one area that we are exploring. Um, another is methods of removing personally identifiable information. So PII, as well as protected health information, so PHI, there's simple ways from either using that differential privacy or using new AI methods to even going into the free text to remove that type of data. And so not expose that more broadly. Another area that we're exploring is synthetic data. So taking the real data that we have or that exists elsewhere and creating a version of it that is synthetic and doesn't include 
the, the same privacy challenges of the original data set, but does include the characteristics of the data set that we can start to give broader access to, to start developing new AI methods, et cetera, as well, while preserving, preserving privacy. And then a fourth one I would say is pretty early stage be around federated learning. So this is where um, you can actually train a machine learning model or test a machine learning model on data that exists in different places that is not actually accessible by the central location. So those are a few of the ways that we are thinking about privacy preserving methods. Sounds like a lot of innovative approaches there. I appreciate your sharing that. Uh, Andrew, what else are you seeing uh, in the way of you know, data management platforms evolving to uh, be more powerful in the way of delivering analysis and yet uh, do it, being more effective in preserving uh, the privacy of the data that those databases hold? This is a really important question. We're thinking about this at kind of three layers right now. You know, The first is, uh, when you look inside your data, inside the schema, and you ask yourself, you know, which parts of this data are, are going to be the highest classification level? Well, the question has always been, how do I put that to use in software, in other words, in a transactional database, uh, while preserving encryption everywhere, uh, without giving up the ability to derive insights from it? And this has been a, a tricky tension in the industry. We've actually been the first to introduce into industry something we're calling queryable encryption. It's it comes out of a research field called structured encryption. It actually allows you to do encryption in use while doing certain classes of queries. It starts with very specific uh, baby step style queries, but over time you'll see us augment more there over time with range queries expected later this year. So that's one area. But the second area to talk about that's going back to that notion of retrieval augmented generation we talked about before, kind of the canonical Gen AI stack. There's something really important to understand about the way these apps are built. And that is that at first, it's very scary to think, how do I make sure that this is secure, that folks are only accessing data that they're appropriately able to or should be able to access? But when you look at the way these apps are built, essentially, if an end user is coming in with a prompt, natural language style, what you can very easily do is combine that vector search query with other hybrid search capabilities and fil filters to ensure that you're only going to use in your prompt engineering pipeline data that that end user is authorized to. And once you realized it's just role-based access control, which we've all been using for decades, but putting it to use ahead of the prompt engineering step, it greatly simplifies the, the, the anxiety around what it means to build appropriate privacy-optimized Gen AI applications. So I think just having that light bulb moment is really important for people. And the third layer of this to me, which is quite different, is all about when you're taking advantage of cloud building blocks, the whole idea there is you're moving up a level of abstraction. You're allowing a smaller number of people to move faster because they're building on a, on a set of building blocks that hide the complexity on the back end, but also hide a lot of the threat vectors. Those threat vectors are now pushed into the service provider and assuming you trust the service provider, this has a lot of benefits because that smaller team can move faster and think less about all these manual components that need to be governed behind the scenes. So in general, the shift to taking advantage of cloud and SaaS services has major implications for us being able to build faster while preserving privacy. And then and let me just follow on that. So how can cloud-based data management platforms, you know, coupled with AI powered tools that are offered by today's cloud providers, you know, how can they further enhance uh, the broader data security landscape for public sector agencies? I think the core here is we now have all the building blocks that we need, whether you're in the private cloud on-prem or fully available now in the public cloud. And I know public sector agencies are going through a long transition there. You, instead of the old posture of lift and shift, you can now move up that level of abstraction, take advantage of modern tools. You can have great modern tools for the application tier, for the data tier. For example, MongoDB Atlas is our service within the, the public cloud, including uh, Atlas for Government. And there's many other uh, compatible tools all around the ecosystem, the frameworks tier, the LLM uh, foundation model serving tier, and more. So you can build with these services uh, and not feel locked in while preserving uh, the ability for small teams to move fast and balance the risk profile. It's kind of the dream state for the public sector. And then Kimberly, from your perspective, as someone that probably uses multiple clouds, uh, externally, internally, et cetera, what, what's really important for you uh, as you move forward to ensure uh, you know, the security of your data uh, with these more modern platforms? 
Yeah, I think most of what has been mentioned by Andrew and I previously are what are kind of top of mind for us. We're continuing to explore the various data-based technologies as well as AI technologies to figure out which ones will best contribute positively to our mission. So really taking a measured approach, figuring out what each solution has to offer, rapidly testing and piloting the potential technologies in lower settings to determine whether or not uh, to invest in it and whether or not it's improving outcomes. Absolutely. Well, Dr. Kimberly McManus and Andrew Davidson, thank you so much for taking a few minutes to share your respective perspectives on this whole topic of modern databases uh, and, and making sure that privacy and security are assured across federal agencies. So thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having us. Thank you.